history's colonizers arrived by boats to plunder and profit in their new world of opportunity. In the age of the internet, however, it's the big tech companies who stand accused these days of exploiting the global south. I'm David Foster. You're watching Roundtable. You are probably one of the billions of people who use the services of the big tech firms every single day. In fact, it is getting hard, is it, not to live without them. But in what we call the global south, Africa, Latin America and Asia, there is increasing concern that people are now subject to what's being called digital colonialism, exploitation through data and information. In the past, empires expanded their power by control of land, trade routes, precious metals and the oceans. In 2019, it may have changed to who controls the digital world. Critics argue that US tech firms such as Amazon, Google, Facebook, Microsoft and Apple are like empires dominating global technology services, data and infrastructure. Between them, they've influenced national advertising in South Africa, automated public services in India, and helped to spread fake news in the 2017 Kenya election. These tech giants argue that they are doing good for the global south. Facebook, for instance, works with local mobile operators to create a free and cheap internet. However, pressure group Global Voices says that Facebook is harvesting user data, fails to use local languages adequately, and pushes users towards Western-focused content. The result, according to one technology expert, a US-centric internet. Are tech giants unlocking economic development for countries in the Global South, or are they exploiting them? Well, I'm very pleased to say that joining us from South Africa, we have Dr. Eugenio Gagliardoni from Vitz University in Johannesburg. With me in the studio, Nick Caudry, Professor of Media Communications and Social Theory from the London School of Economics. Also here, Maria Farrell, an Internet Policy Analyst, and Leon Emirali, Chief Executive of the Darwin Consulting Group, a communications enterprise. Listen, thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Maria, let me start with you. We're not talking here about eBay. We're not talking about buying something on Amazon. It is something that you equate as having the same importance as electricity. In what way? Well, so the internet is what we call a generative technology in that it is a technology that lets you do lots of other things, lots of things that you didn't even imagine doing when it was invented. So we compare it a little bit to electricity in the 20th century or the internal combustion engine in the 19th century. Both of those inventions weren't just a single device or a single technology, but what they did was they structurally changed whole economies and allowed them to do lots of different things that they couldn't do before. So Nick, where, where did this colonialism come into this? Where, where? Well, I agree. It's with a strong you. word, isn't it? It, it, it is. It, it, it's it is. a damning word these days. I agree with Maria that a new order is being built. The question is to think about what type of order is being built through this convenience. Historic colonialism is rightly associated with terrible violence, uh, oppressive relations, and in many ways that still continues today. However, its core was the grabbing of resource, the grabbing of land, what was in the land, the bodies to to get that stuff out of the land. What if now? a new period of colonialism is beginning, where there's a new land grab. But the land grab is targeted at something very, very different, which is human beings, our lives, our experience, what can be extracted for economic profit through the medium of data. That's what I think we need to think Isn't about. Isn't that simple capitalism, that you use people to make profits for yourself so you can reinvest and give more people jobs and thereby increase your profits? Oh, and it, it, it's a cycle. Of course, capitalism continues. And that's a big difference from the historic colonialism, which started before capitalism. In fact, it provided the fuel for capitalism. Today's new colonialism starts on the basis of capitalism. So that's why it doesn't need so much violence. 
It can rely on the fact that we're rather used to entering into contracts, entering into convenient apps and other arrangements, which draw us into this new order. But it's the nature of the land grab going on that we need to think about. And that is of a colossal and historic proportion. OK, well, let's go, let's go to South Africa. Uh, Eugenie, uh, thanks for taking the time to come and talk to us. Thank there you. are some countries that are being exploited. We will get on to those in just a moment, if we can. But you've cited to us two examples of countries where things are being done relatively well in Africa. Uh, that is Rwanda, that is, that is Kenya. What dangers have they avoided? Well, in the case of Rwanda and Kenya, I would say that uh, the governments in particular have taken uh, the lead in shaping their information societies. Uh, and it was interesting to see how uh, they have led their relationship with other great powers. Uh, in the case of Rwanda, it's quite unique uh, in uh, their ability to develop relationship with South Korea and roll out 4G uh, communication in uh, a relatively short time frame. In the case of Kenya, there has been a lot of talk about rebranding the whole country uh, through ideas such as the Silicon Savannah. And, uh, and this has become a very important uh, uh, new frontier in uh, in the development with uh, a kind of uh, um, uh, tension with uh, other powers uh, which have branded ICTs, new communication technologies, uh, as the new frontier for uh, for developing countries, but have found, uh, done really little. And so they took things in their hands uh, and they have tried to shape uh, their own ideas of information societies uh, in quite distinct ways. Now, let me let me come to you. We're talking about exploitation. Is that yeah. what is happening here? I think we have to talk about intent, and I don't think that is what the tech giants, Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, whoever it might be, I don't think that is their intention. Well, their intent, the old colonizers, was not necessarily to, to kill people, not necessarily to enslave them, but to exploit them, to make the most of their opportunities with them. That was an end result. So is this not the same thing, but sort of couched in a different term? That you say, well, it's not their intention to do this to people. Yeah, I yeah. Think I think it's the end result. Yeah, it is. I, I think there is a bit of give and take. I mean, you know, you look at what Facebook are offering to developing countries or the global south, as, as, as we've described it. You know, there is uh, a, an element of actually giving them opportunity that they otherwise wouldn't have had in, in developing countries where the infrastructure is not as advanced as it is in, in the West, if you like. So, you know, I think there is a bit of give and take. It's Yes, there is an element of, uh, of exploitation, if we want to call it that, but there is also opportunity being provided um, as, a, as a consequence of that as well. Eugenia, we're talking about exploitation. Um, give me an example of a country that you think has perhaps been uh, pillaged by the outside invaders, the tech invaders, and, and, and not necessarily able to do anything about it. Well, I can't find that many examples, uh, to, to be sure. But uh, uh, let's think of the case of Ethiopia. And um, Ethiopia has developed a very unique relationship with China. And uh, the Ethiopian government had a very stubborn uh, project uh, of maintaining monopoly and uh, expanding access. And this was impossible without uh, support of external players. So China came forward with the largest uh, um, loan in the history of telecommunication in Africa, more than $3 billion. And this, in a way, was empowering and was allowing the Ethiopian government to do what they wanted to do. At the same time, now Ethiopia is in a huge debt in order to repay uh, the loan that was provided by China. So going forward, uh, it depends a lot on uh, uh, the big player, China, and whether they decide that they want the money back or not. Uh, but uh, I would say Ethiopia is locked in. OK, thanks very much indeed. Yeah, yeah, please. Can I pick up on that? I think Ignacio is absolutely right that China is crucial to this. That's another big difference with historic colonialism. This is bipolar, West Coast of America and China. But I think when we mention Facebook, we've got to remember uh, the Facebook Free Basics uh, platform which was offered as a convenience, as a benefit to expand the internet into countries that have very low infrastructure. It wasn't resisted in most African countries because they were in no position to resist. It was resisted in India, where civil society started to realize what was happening to the data that was being gathered through this stripped down internet that was being offered. We have to think about the long term. These are long term transformations, yes, in the short term, there appears to be convenience. But unless, as Ignacio says, there are strong government interventions to uh, actually mold the policy, to change the direction, to shift the balance of power, we, I think, will uh, be moving in a colonial and direction. And Ethiopia, I think I'm right in saying, um, use some of this technology. It is alleged to spy on its, the government to spy on political opponents and thereby yes. give it an, an advantage in 
of the electoral system. But are we talking here about just data that people want to get their hands on? Or are we talking about an infrastructure that they want to put in? Uh, or are there other elements, or is it all of this? Well, so if I'm a small, uh, less developed country or a middle-income country government, and I want to get broadband out to my people or just basic connectivity, I've, there, are two, there are two choices. <clears throat> I can make, there are two shows in town. There is America, surveillance, capitalism, big tech firms, Facebook Zero, they'll help you roll out so-called internet to your population, but actually you will find that your population will then end up thinking Facebook is the internet and your po the people in your country will be effectively providing data, using apps, using a tiny sliver of reality on the top of the internet to be consumers and to have data extracted. But what they will not be doing is building websites, building companies, building anything that is independent of Facebook's infrastructure. So beware Greeks bearing gr gifts. But then you look at the other offer, which is the China offer, and it's a whole stack model. China will give you model laws for surveilling your population. Um, China will sell you 5G or a whole um, stack of technology for surveillance. This is a debate we're having in this country at the moment, in the Massively. UK, about uh, Huawei 5G and whether or not, in fact, it's actually sort of going to damage national security. But So that's another issue. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But it's all part of what I call a full service stack that China is offering, which goes all the way from the laws to the tech to even in the case of Uganda. Um, we've discovered, have sent 36 policymakers over to China to learn how to do surveillance and censorship on their population. So my take on this is you don't have to choose between you know one bad colo colonialist power and the other bad colonialist power actually look at what, how the internet was invented it's an open architecture it um, allows you to do things that are not part of the google stack not part of the china stack there are actually there's actually mm. a different option here i can probably learn how to drive a car um when i'm taught by you know family members or something like that but but can i learn to sort of exploit the internet unless somebody more experienced in this case china or india comes and shows me how and i think that goes back to the crux of the issue which is is a little bit of internet better than no internet at all and, and i think that in many cases it is and going back to david's point you know the the free basics that facebook's offering it is an introduction to the internet in a in a you know a town or a country that might have not had anything um, so is that better? Is it a good introduction? Well, Here, I'm, we are, I think we're confusing the technology yeah. with the social order that's being built. That's the crucial thing. I, I, I agree there are choices, and that makes it a very interesting moment in history. If we think about China, it has the most sophisticated super platforms in the world, which integrate not just surfing, not just social media, so you, but you're finance. Buy this in, aren't you? If well, you want to get, that is an option for much ahead. of the world. Yeah. However, the costs of that are a social order. With the social credit okay. system is increasingly well known. These are not uh, necessarily compatible with human freedom. And these are the choices we're having to make today. Eugenio, um, I see that you've mentioned that um, the current models are not necessarily the best ones to follow, that people should um, have an entrepreneurial spirit themselves, not necessarily take lessons from others, but it's very difficult to do that, isn't it? Right. And before I get to that point, may I just disagree with the with some of the points that were made just now about China. So I think it's quite easy to point the fingers at China and forgetting African agency. I want to use an example and going back to Ethiopia. So because of the Snowden, Snowden revelation, we now know that the NSA has been training Ethiopian spies in surveilling their citizen as well as uh, Ethiopians in the diaspora. And because of very good work done at the Citizen Lab in Canada, we know that the Ethiopian government has been purchasing software for surveillance uh, from British and Italian companies. Uh, and we know very well that China supported uh, all the uh, uh, expansion of the telecommunication system. So we have this kind of paradox uh, where if you are an Ethiopian spy, you probably have been trained by the Americans to use some software produced in, in Europe to harvest data on a Chinese network. So this is quite interesting and it's not because of China. So no, we have to I pay attention to who we are blaming for a specific okay. state. Can, can I just bring you back to my point, which is if you are looking for technology in whatever sense, if you're looking to get your country ahead, you are going to look to outside agencies. Whereas I think you're suggesting that the best models should be ones that are created themselves within countries to prevent uh, this form of colonization. I agree. And uh, there are a number of examples, you know, a kind of a tired example that is used all the time is M-Pesa. M-Pesa is this mobile transfer system that was created in Kenya, and with support actually from the British government uh, at, the, at the beginning. Uh, and it has become the main way of uh, 
um, uh, transferring money and paying for any kind of goods. And if we look at the case of Somalia and uh, a state without the government, uh, uh, there are some very interesting example of how the economy has become a cashless economy because of the conflict uh, and because of the need to rely on something that's not cash, uh, that can be taken away or can, you can be attacked for it. Uh, and so hardship does produce innovation. The problem is, uh, can it do it on a mass scale? There are a lot of uh, small cases uh, that are very worth of attention, but scaling it up at the level of a whole country, that's the challenge. And that's where the bigger players come in with some time uh, little understanding of uh, the local scenario. Okay, I'm sure you've all got points you'd like to make to that, but my, my suggestion is that um, we are in danger here of thinking of the internet as one thing, whereas in fact that's rather like sort of saying the economy is one thing. There are so many different facets to it. So we need to break it up, don't we, and take a look at where it's working for these people, where it's not working uh, for those people in, in those countries. How do we do that? Uh, um I mean, I think the problem is that the internet is expensive to invest in. And so a country wants to have some help in doing that. And But the issue is that I think when, say, a Facebook comes in and says, we will help you wire your whole country, um, it's attractive to the government, but it's not so attractive to the people. Because what's happening, and why I think digital colonialism is not perhaps the right name for this, is because we're looking at states interacting with states. So it's not like, you know, England comes in and colonizes Ireland, where I'm from, um, and then extracts all the rents and the resources. It's more like China or the US comes in and says, here's our fantastic model to the government. Here is how we can help you either extract uh, revenues from your citizens, but actually we'll, we'll expatriate them ourselves. If you're the tech, big tech giants are from the Chinese, here's how we can help you control your people. How do you avoid that? I'm not sure those differences are so crucial because after all, the Indian Empire was based around a, something called the East India Company, which is both a corporation and an arm of the British government. It, it did both, and it actually invented a lot of the surveillance techniques which we now benefit from or suffer from today. But, but rather than go back to the, the history, how do we avoid the situation that we're, that we're saying? You said digital colonization is the wrong word for it, but how do we avoid, how, how do these countries avoid the traps that are being set for them, perhaps by people who simply want to make profit and use the data that they get from uh, these citizens for their own ends rather than for the ends of the... I, I think the themselves? first step is to name what's going on for what it is and to see it clearly and to see it on a large historical scale. But the second step, and this is vital, and we probably all agree on this, is for governments to have a very clear stake in how they can intervene, how they can operate with other governments. No one government can stand alone in this. And then to prioritize public values, social values, preserving the right type of society, that, those are the core issues, rather than just the extraction of profit through data, because that is corrosive of social value in the long run. Leon, I've kept you quiet for a little bit, but I know you've got a lot to say. I think all good points, and, and yes, we do probably all agree on that. Um, the difficulty that I see from this is that the limited internet that is perhaps being offered, um, it isn't in the spirit of what the internet was intended for, which is for people to create, for people to be flexible, for people to be entrepreneurial, be enterprising, or you know, be an activist. It is limited, that's worrying, but I'll go back to the point which is, do the people in these countries who are using these services feel that they'd rather have nothing or would they rather have this access that is controlled, that is dictated on them, if you like to want to use that phrase? But or does it have to be all or nothing? I think in some of the countries where it's happening, it does. Because as Maria says, you know, this is expensive to implement and, and the resources might not be there. And if Facebook are coming in and saying, we'll give you this wonderful opportunity to, you know, to, to have some limited internet infrastructure, in my view, that's better than nothing. Would, would Facebook be at all prepared if a government turned around to it and said, yes, we, we'd like what you're offering us, but we only like part of what you're offering us because we think some of it is, is insidious. We think some of it is, is going to damage our country, damage our citizens um, and, and lead to exploitation. This is the bit we would like. Will you just give us that bit? Would they be prepared to listen to that? Because they're still going to make a lot of money. I suppose it, that's a commercial decision. Again, it's what will the shareholders of Facebook be, uh, be most responsive to? And I think because that, that's neither all nor nothing. That is the middle part. That is the middle ground, yeah. No, I, I agree with that. And I think there probably is a, a cause to, to say, well, well, we'll pick and choose and cherry pick. It's not ideal, um, but we can't, we can't sort of be talking about uh, in a perfect world. We don't live in one. So 
I think that ultimately it is going to be a commercial decision that the tech giants make. Um, and I think it is a stepping stone towards uh, the full sort of sense of the internet and the flexibilities and individualism that provides. Let's go, let's go to Eugenio one more time. I'm going to pick Nigeria as an example, only because mm -hmm. it is the most populated country and it is, it is the richest country in Africa. Let's say the government in Nigeria turned around to, and we, we use Facebook as an example here, turned around to Facebook and said, I'm only going to take half of your model because I think that's the only bit that's good for my country. Do you think Facebook would be prepared to do that in the or is it the all or nothing scenario? Would it be prepared to sort of take some profits rather than um, no profits at all? Well, I would expect uh, in uh, in countries like Nigeria, as uh, some of uh, your guests said, uh, uh, in, in some places, Facebook is the Internet. So Facebook, he's very powerful, uh, but also has uh, quite uh, of an image problem and uh, quite an inability to act uh, as uh, uh, as it can be able to do in uh, in uh, in other countries where there are greater resources. Let's take the case of uh, hate speech, for example. And uh, and uh, the government is asking Facebook to do a lot of things. And Facebook so far has always like pushed back and uh, and said uh, and said no. I think this this situation can't last forever. At some point, uh, Facebook, if it wants to operate in this country, will have to find some compromises. Uh, what we have seen so far is not in the good direction. Is in the direction of just listening to state more who yeah. does in power and uh, and take down hate speech but uh, there's a lot of people in Nigeria to listen to and I don't think they're listened to do you think do you understand what I'm, I'm trying to get at here um, that um, it needs a strong government perhaps or a strong movement within society um, to say to the big tech giants listen we don't like really what you're doing if you want to play in our playground uh, then you've got to change uh, uh, so it might take that is that will there anywhere? So that is the will for that is there in some countries for sure. You see competition regulation, you see data protection, all of those kinds of things that are being wielded against big tech. Um, but I think the, for me, the real thing is that so many states are looking at particularly the Facebook office offer and saying, this is fantastic because it helps me not just build out the Internet, a tiny curated version of the Internet, but it helps me corral my population into a very controlled social media space where I can project disinformation at them to my heart's content. So if you look at a country like the Philippines, which is the highest rate of Facebook Zero and Facebook.org and penetration in the country, to Filipinos, Facebook is the internet. And that has been weaponized by the Duterte regime and used to basically build authoritarianism. Is it, in, Our, in your opinion, it is as um, deadly as perhaps giving somebody their first cigarette first pack of cigarettes for nothing, because you know then you, you've got them for life. You know, I think it's as deadly as giving a baby a grenade. That's how deadly it is, because if you look at Myanmar, where, again, huge Facebook um, uh, presence in that country, yeah. that's how people get on the Internet. And Facebook was weaponized by the Burmese military to radicalize people in their hatred of the Rohingya so, so population. So strong authorities, strong social movements, strong public protests, perhaps? I think that's part of it, and that's what happened in India. But I think you've hit the nail on the head. This isn't just about what individuals do. It's not so much like a drug. It's a totally new way of structuring society. We're not living in the same sort of societies that we did 10 or 15 years ago. So the idea of the weapon in the hand of the baby is a form of violence, utterly unpredictable. Humanity cannot live with it. We have to think at that level. And I think there's one other thing we haven't been uh, getting to, which is we've been talking only about the so-called big tech giants. There are also many s smaller players, data brokers, insurers, all forms of business, seeing their business models based on the extraction of data. The marketing of tool, too, of course, in many... These are part of the the broader order that's being built, and they are not necessarily the friends of freedom, and we have to think about it on a larger scale. To talk about Facebook all the time may, in the long run, prove a distraction. You see, one of the things is... It, it, it... To me, it's, we talk about data as though it's something new, whereas, in fact, um, companies have been targeting people through their adverts for years by, by working out where they like to go, what they like to do, etc., etc. So this is just on a bigger scale. I don't think we can turn back the tide, but how can we use it perhaps to our advantage? How can these countries use it to their advantage? Well, I think we hit the nail on the head, really, because this isn't anything particularly sinister. You know, this data that is being Not collected, necessarily. Not necessarily, but I think in its current model, I'm not saying it can't morph into something that might become sinister, but in its current model, 
Um, ultimately, what's happening is Facebook collecting data to create a better advertising model, and you might get an advert for things that you like as opposed to things that you don't like. At this point, that's all we're at. And I think that these discussions... Except with the news feeds where you're fed information that might be contrary to your views, but supports the people that Facebook would like to see elected into power. I mean, that's another matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think you're quite right. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't just dismiss this entirely, because mm. when we have seen reasons, that Maria's described, of, of the way Facebook's being used or social media's being used to spread disinformation. But ultimately, at this scale, it's just showing you pictures of shoes that you might but like. I think we're getting distracted by the fakeness issue here. The key issue is whether the data on your social media is used to uh, affect whether you can get a job, whether you can get insurance, whether your kids can get into a school, whether you can get health service. That's the broader social order. And we, we, we should talk of. more about China when it comes to that in terms of Thank surveilling absolutely. certain aspects of society. This week they found somebody through facial recognition who had been on the run for three years. Listen, I, we've got to stop it there. Yeah, we will come back to it. Thank you very much indeed. Eugenio in South Africa, appreciate your time. Thank you very much to you. my guests around the studio here. It's fascinating. Baby with a hand grenade. Uh, think of that one as uh, you look up TRT World Round Table. Uh, that's on YouTube. TRT World Round Table. You can Google us if you like. Oh, no, hang on. Maybe that's a bad thing. <laughs> See you next time.